Thanks for coming out tonight. I'm going to give a short talk about uh, an introduction to GStreamer. First thing I want to talk about is why would you use GStreamer? So GStreamer is a multimedia framework. And so you would use it if you had to write a media application. Uh, the most common example would be you want to make a video player. You can use GStreamer to make a video player. But you you can also do other things, like stream video over RTP, or receive video over RTP, or whatever. So one reason you'd use it is if you're going to code up a multimedia application. Now another reason to use it, the main reason I started using it, was to get access to graphics hardware. So with GStreamer, you can actually get access to the codecs that are shipping with modern Intel CPUs. You can get access to the integrated graphics that comes with hardware codecs. So you can actually decode your X264 video. Even, <clears throat> even more modern CPUs, you can decode or encode in hardware X265, even VP8 and VP9, which are familiar with YouTube. I use VP8 and VP9, and you can do that in hardware. And the other thing is, GStreamer has this plug-in architecture. So if you wanted to write a custom plug-in, one example might be you were going to write your own decryption plug-in so that you can decrypt your video stream. And after decryption, you can use the other standard GStreamer processing plugins to do whatever you want. So that <clears throat> so that's getting more into the why. So if, if you look at something such as Intel came out with this media SDK, so they will provide you with a whole documentation package and a whole software library to program that uh, Intel graphics hardware. But if you want to like read input from a file, well, you got to write all the code to read input from a file. Their media SDK doesn't come with that. Well, GStreamer has a file source plugin. So if you're going to read from a file, GStreamer is already going to do that for you. You can concentrate on the part of the code that you, you want to work on. And then, if you ever want to do something with video or streaming audio, in a script, GStreamer ships with a command line tool, tool to, that's very friendly to scripting. So that's kind of why. This is a high level block diagram, kind of what you're going to get with GStreamer. It's going to ship with some command line tools an inspector, a launcher, and the editor. You can actually edit videos with GStreamer. I haven't done too much of that. It's possible. And it's all based off their, what they call their core, core framework and their pipeline architecture. And a lot of the functionality is provided by these plugins. So as, as you can see, you're going to have a file plugin. You have to get your media from some source. You know, there's a plug-in to read to video from HTTP. Once, you're gonna, once you get your video, you're going to want to do something with it. And that's where you're going to get into things like demuxing it, decoding it, and then doing some processing and re-encoding it. So here's a little bit of a zoom in on what they call their, their pipeline architecture. And so also, over the years, I've had the experience where I'm using my computer and I want to play, I just want to watch a video. And I get some error message that says, you don't have the codec for that. So then I search the web for the codec and I'm like, what does this all mean? And I have an MP4, I have an MP4 video. Does everyone come to you and say, I have an MP4 video? Well, you don't have an MP4 video. MP4 is a file extension. 
usually it's indicating, it's a big clue that it's using the QuickTime container format. And once you start getting, if you start getting in a GStreamer, you will learn these container formats and what a codec means. Because in order to use GStreamer to construct these pipelines, you kind of have to know that or your pipeline's not going to work. And they, they, they've, they've diagrammed their open source codec. But basically, this example is showing that they're going to have a file. The file is going to use the odd container format, and inside that file, they have an audio stream, and they have a video stream. The audio stream is using the Vorbis codec, and the video stream is using the Theora codec. So, to play that back, they're going to use the Theora decoder and the Vorbis decoder. So it's very explicit now. If you're going to play this back in GStream or construct a pipeline, you have to know all this. What container format you're using, what's inside your container, so that you can successfully play it back or do whatever other processing you're going to do with it. Okay, so now let's talk about, okay, what's some GStream or hardware? Okay, what, what started this off for me? Well, 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 what do we have here? We've seen the Raspberry Pi. This is a single board computer that has as its CPU an Tegra ARM processor from NVIDIA. But it also contains a Pascal GPU, which has 256 CUDA cores. And it retails for slightly more, but 10x the price of a Raspberry Pi. Anymore. But the thing is, if you wanted to, if you wanted to decode some 4K 265 video, this would do it without using a lot of CPU. What's a CUDA core? So the CUDA core is a technology from NVIDIA, and basically it allows you to use the graphic processor hardware as generic compute nodes. It's basically something along the lines of commute, compute, compute node device architecture or some such, whatever the acronym expands to. It works well for problems that are inherently highly parallelizable. Well, what was happening was that <clears throat> NVIDIA was shipping more and more powerful GPUs with the equivalent of ALUs, arithmetic logic units. Programmers are saying, wow, I don't just want to play games, I want to make use of that hardware. And I want to be able to do any algorithm that's highly parallelizable. Any algorithm, not just graphics manipulation. So what CUDA allows you to do is program that hardware in C. And before, they, programmers are jumping through all kinds of hoops to use their rendering engine and to force that graphics hardware into doing something it was never designed to do. So, and then over the years, the number of core, the number of CUDA cores you get with your GPU has been exponentially increasing. Like back in the day, I think, what did you have? 64 CUDA cores. But over time, you get more and more CUDA cores. So, so can you write code to run on a specific core then? Is it, or is that kind of out of your control and is kind of assigned? Yeah, how, how's the, how are they being utilized for computational power and stuff? And, uh, well, I haven't done a lot of... I can give you a quick example. If you're, if you're doing anything that's vector or matrix based, um, and you, you use their compiler, it'll, it'll find those loops and it'll optimize them. It will it, it, you, as far as I know, there's no direct call into their library. It's like it figures out that it can grab this big chunk of your code and turn it and, so there's some and massively smarts yeah to, parallel loaded into into the into the GPU and execute it in one clock cycle essentially okay and say how, how much fast uh, how fast is uh, one core compared to a typical CPU doing the same work I'm not sure they have Nvidia boards that are pushing uh, teraflops 
three, four, five teraflops now. So. I can tell you that when I was looking at it, let's say a pretty standard image algorithm, you could write highly optimized C code, you could use the Intel optimizing compiler, and you could use these Intel performance primitives, which would give you the vector hardware on Intel, the IPP library. You could take your imaging algorithm and convert it to use the NVIDIA GPU, and you're losing the benefit of having access to RAM, because all your data has to go over PCI Express bus, go up to the GPU, do the computation, and come down. And for a long time, people were asking me to be able to do DMA transfers to the GPU. I think they may have gotten around to doing that. But even with that penalty, highly optimized imaging algorithms were run 10x faster. There were lots of white paper studies that came out that I've reviewed that showed imaging algorithms being sped up 10x by GPU. I would think at least it's probably a lot more than that. Yeah, so some of the more extreme examples people will come back and say, well, you really didn't squeeze out every ounce of performance out of that CPU. <laughs> so yeah, if you had some naive algorithm and you didn't use IPP and you didn't use Intel's compiler, and then you coded up an optimized CUDA algorithm, you might see 100x performance. So you, but someone might look back, like the, the diehard C program is like, you, your C code's not optimal. And, like when those guys get at it, I've seen it reliably 10x faster if you offload it to the GPU. Another thing I can just tell you from anecdotally, like if you go get an MRI, okay, 3D image reconstruction, no matter where you go, you're gonna go get scanned by a General Electric machine, you're gonna get scanned by a Toshiba machine, all that processing now has been offloaded to GPU. So if you take something like like what I'm, what I'm about to go through now, we're going to display 2D images on the video screen using hardware codecs. And we can do that at easily 60 frames a second, right? When you go get a medical scan, some of these image reconstructions, the amount of data collect and they have to process and then reconstruct, these imaging algorithms can take, let's say, eight hours. So, and then I come in and I give you, sell you a new machine, and I can reconstruct that image in one hour that used to take eight hours. Guess what? Now the imaging center can have more patients go through and get imaged. And then the imaging center makes more money by doing more scans. But the, this GPU architecture is kind of taken over like these parallel workloads. And again, these things, like, like if we go back, we we're talking, everyone, it's been a recent topic of conversation, you know, and with the buzzwords now, NVIDIA is marketing this Jetson board as a use for deep learning artificial intelligence algorithms, of course, because they want to sell boards. But back in the day, if we look at what IBM did when they were winning chess, they actually made custom hardware to play chess, right? If you wanted to speed something up, you did it in custom hardware, right? But these GPUs are so powerful and give you a generic interface to access those cores. Anyone who's making a product to sell for profit, they're not gonna design a custom hardware board. They're gonna offload the workload to these GPUs now. Another interesting fact, if there is a list of the top 100 supercomputers that gets maintained. It gets updated every year. Different research universities, like Los Alamos, whichever ones, they want to be on that list kind of for PR and marketing, I guess. I don't know who has the fastest supercomputer. That list is now dominated by this heterogeneous hardware where you have Intel CPUs, and they say, how many GPUs can I load into a motherboard? And Supermicro will sell you a server with enough PCI Express expansion slots that you can fit four of the high-end GPUs on one motherboard. It's gonna cost thousands of dollars, which you 
buy all those GPUs. But you can do it. Okay. Well, with GStream, you can also access, like I said, the embedded Intel graphics hardware that you probably have on your machine already if you have. My laptop is running a three-year-old, I bought this laptop three years ago. It's running a mobile core M3, and it has access to the Intel X264 codec. You just, you just have to compile GStreamer from source. And if you're a Linux guy, no sweat, right? I did it this weekend. I finished on Monday. Because, <laughs> of course, it didn't build from the master branch. And it didn't build with the automate tools. I didn't install another build tool to get a whole different story. But I got access to my hardware codec now from GStream. If you're going to do some video manipulation, you're going to need some sample content. And it turns out, no matter where you go, if you want to get legal sample content, it's like hiding behind a bush. <laughs> no, it's, it's technically possible to record HD video off broadcast, but then for me to copy that and give it to you, well, lots of questions come up. So, who here has seen the Big Buck Bunny? All right. For those of you who have, haven't seen the Big Buck Bunny, your homework assignment is to go watch the Big Buck Bunny, and you can thank me later. But the great thing about the bunny is it was created as an open source video meant to be freely distributed. And so we, you can use it in technology demonstrations. And it comes in a lot of resolutions and codecs, and what do I have? I went out and downloaded from their website 4K video, 60 frames a second. And I can tell you my laptop cannot play this back with software codecs. So that's the other thing. A lot of codecs are first developed in software for ease of development, but if it's ever gonna go in a TV or computer monitor, eventually there's going to be a hardware to decode it. <clears throat> so this also shows you one of the GStreamer tools. It's called GST Discoverer. And it tells you what's in your file. So this is telling us we're using the QuickTime format. We have AC3 audio. We have two audio tracks, AC3 and MP3. We have H.264 video, and it even tells us the resolution. And this is another thing you often see, which these codecs, another part of the confusion around codecs is they often have more than one name, like Rhodes in Illinois. I like to call it H.264. Some people like to call it AVC. What's AVC? Advanced Video. I like to call H265, H260 feet, 265. Some people like to call it HEVC. That's like high efficiency video. I don't even know. I like I, I stick with H265. <laughs> so we're gonna be I'm gonna be using um, Big Buck Bunny, 4K video as, as my examples. So the first example I'm gonna show is transcode. And what do I mean by transcode? We're gonna unencode the video do some processing and then re-encode the video. We're going to do it from the command line using one of the GStreamer tools called GST Launch. So this is just saying we're going to build up this pipeline. Command line tools have this kind of funny architecture where you're, you're putting together these elements and the elements have a source and a sink. Okay? And the file source is going to connect to a demuxer. The first thing we have to do is we have to demux our container. And we know it's QuickTime from our Discover, so we're going to use a QuickTime demuxer. And we're going to connect it to a parser. We know we have H.264 video. And we're going to, we're going to parse the video 
from the container. The way I look at it is that these container formats have a lot of metadata, and there's actual video data. There's an actual binary video data that's coded according, in this case, to H.264. So we're going to parse that out of the container. Now we're going to decode it. And in this case, there's a plug-in to GStreamer. I think it's called H.264 DEC. That's a software codec. What we have here is the MFX H264 DC. <clears throat> Just by calling this plug in a GStreamer, I'm going to use the hardware codec. Then I'm going to use some more hardware and I'm going to scale that video down to 720p. And again, I'm going to do the MFX VPP is indicating that it's using the Intel hardware and integrated graphics chip. Once I'm done scaling it, I'm going to re-encode it as 264. And I'm going to use a hardware 264 encoder. I'm going to pass it some parameters on the command line telling it to use the high profile. Now, just as an example, I wanted to use a different container format. So there's another format, Matroska, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's just another container format. But I demuxed QuickTime and I'm going to remux it into a container. And I'm choosing Matroska just as an example. And I'm going to say, in this case, I'm not going to play back to screen, I'm just going to write it out to the file system. And the bunny video is about 10 and a half minutes to do this transcode and then scaling and then to write it back, to re-encode it and write it back can be done in five minutes. So basically all that can happen faster than you can watch the video, which has implications for the next couple slides. So what's so next? Oh, sorry. oh, sorry. Hey, maybe you're going to go into this, but that's just the video. How does QT demux when you pull it off an H.264 purse? What, does the audio streams just go away? Yes. Uh, we have stripped the audio out of this. Okay. This is the video only. And we basically dropped the audio on the floor. Yeah, I was going to ask um, how, um, uh, since we're dropping the audio on the floor and keeping the video, where exactly does that happen? in this whole list of things happening. I mean, it's just QTD mux, but how would we, how would it, how would the line change if we were doing the opposite, keeping the audio, dropping the video? Oh, okay. The next slide. Well, the next slide is gonna do audio and video. Oh. Okay. But if you wanted the audio, Where that H.264 parse is, you're going to have something like MP3 parse or AC3 parse, whatever the audio track is encoded as. You're going to parse the audio, and instead of H.264 decoder, you're going to have like MP3 decoder and so on. And you can, one of the things you're going to want to do in certain situations, you're going to want to get away from some legacy something with a legacy of patent encumbrance and go to some audio format. AAC is, a, the advanced audio codec is not patent encumbered for you to use AAC without worrying about the content please. So just the way I'm parsing this command line in my head, the exclamation marks, marks are basically pipes, but they can't use pipes. Yes, and they, uh, they so when you first look at this, from, if you've done some Unix stuff, those exclamation points look like the pipe what, what it's doing is separating elements in GStreamer. It's not exactly, the, they don't work exactly the same as a Unix pipe. It's like its own special syntax, which is very, excuse me, very similar to a pipe. Yeah, this whole thing is all just arguments to that GST yeah. wall. Right. And the other thing to keep in mind, the other thing to keep in mind here is what, what, what they've done here with this G, GST launch 
you can do all this, you can create this, this is creating a, what they call a pipeline. And like we're showing, the output of the parse is the input of the decoder. And then the output of the decoder is the input of the video post processor. And that up, and it, it connects this pipe together. You can do that all in C code. If you're gonna write your own application, the primary language that these plugins and the framework itself is written in is C. They have Python bindings and Rust bindings. But you can do all this in C code. So if you're gonna write your own C application, anything you can do on the command line, you can do in C code. And in fact, if you code your application, you get more flexibility than what they expose on the command line. Although they do expose a lot of flexibility on the command line. Can't you also, like where you have that H264 parse, can, is there, there's a syntax where you can attach a, uh, an input symbol to it, so you can actually, it's actually more more powerful than piping because you can, I think you can build Teeth. branches. Oh yeah, that's good. There's, there's some, some syntax where you can, you can, you can attach to that parse statement to say, and know, know the output of this ever forevermore is this symbol and then uh, use it later on in, the, in that string. Something yeah, I think maybe in the next example we'll see some of, some of what you're talking about. So let, let's go ahead with the video and audio. And I, I'm putting in a small font the things we've already seen before, because it becomes a very long command line, <laughs> and I want to show you what's new. So what's new? Here we have the Numoxer. We've given the Demoxer a name, so we can, in the future, we can refer the Demoxer as Demox. The other thing is, the Demoxer actually has more than one output. In our case, it's actually going to have three outputs. It's going to have, because it has two audio tracks, so it has an audio underscore zero and an audio underscore one. It has a video track, so it has a video underscore zero. Again, getting back to its program with C, so the first audio track is number zero, of course. The other thing is it allows us to do on the command line, we have this queue, and that queue is gonna actually create a th another thread. So we're gonna create a multi-threaded application just from the command line. And it also acts as a queue. There's, a, there's an actual buffer there. And then we were saying like, well, what, what if you wanted the audio? You, in this case, the correct parser to use is MPEG audio parse. And so we're, we're, we're actually taking that MP3 track here. And when we're going to decode it, we're going to use MPEG 1, 2, 3 audio decode. And then we have to convert it. The only reason we're converting it is because we're going to re-encode it as AAC, so we have another coder, uh, another encoder, an AAC encoder. Then, Again, we haven't even got there yet, but we see another symbol, we see mux period. Because later on in our pipeline, we're gonna name the mux, mux. And then, again, this is where it kind of is different from pipes. I would expect between mux and demux, if it was a Unix thing, I would expect another pipe there. But it's just a space, and then you say, okay, now start, now I'm gonna start another demux block, or they call them bins. When you group elements together in GStream, they're called bins. We're going to start the, another Dmux bin. We're going to see, okay, what to do with the video? Again, we're going to put it in queue, and we're going to do that same, that same video processing chain we saw in the last slide. And then, we're going to say, once you've done that video processing, start muxing it. And then we name our muxer. We're, we're going to use the QuickTime muxer. And we named it mux. And we're going to write it to a file on disk. And so what we've done in this case is we've taken that 4K video. We've made, we're using the same hardware codec, using X264, but we scaled the resolution. And we, chained, we went from two audio tracks to one. And the audio track is going to use AAC. This is a carefully chosen example because H.264 video and AAC audio happens to be the most friendly thing to use for 
HTTP live streaming or HLS. So that's why I've chosen those that audio codec or that video codec. Which gets to the next example. I suggested that we could create a video on demand server. Well, how are we going to do that? And again, we've seen this plugin architecture, and we've been we've been using a file sync. We've just been transcoding the video and writing it to a file on disk. Well, there's something called an HLS sync, which we're going to see. So that previous example where we're transcoding the audio and the video, we're using a different MUX again. Again, HLS is going to use a transport stream. Now, your, standard, your standard QuickTime format is not conducive to streaming because there's one table that describes all the metadata. So you actually have to wait until the whole file is written before you can decode a QuickTime file. They've come out with something recently called, I think it's called QuickTime Fragments. But a lot of streaming applications end up using something called a transport stream. And in fact, the H high definition broadcast standard in the US uses transport streams. Your, your digital TV, when it receives over the air, HD, is receiving transport streams. Because there's enough metadata in there to trans to um, decode, I don't know, chunks of chunks of the video stream as you're going along. And so this is gonna create on our file system something that's suitable that you could serve with a web server and people could connect to with their mobile device and play back the video. So let's try it. Let's see how this goes. Who's on? Is there anyone? Is there anyone that's on the guest network? Oh, in their their mobile device is on the guest network. Oh, okay. I found it. Because we're gonna have about ten minutes worth of this demo to try to, if if anyone wants to try to play along. Fresh edition. <laughs> <laughs> so this this is the this is the same command I showed in my um, slide. I'm actually gonna run it on my file system, and then I have to go somewhere and I have to start my web server. But for this purposes, I'm going to, I'm just going to run a web server on port 80 on my machine from the directory where I'm. So if you want to see what's in that directory, I don't know if you can see, if you can read that. But there's a playlist and segment files being created on the file system. So if we, Your IP address, so we can yes. start whacking you. Yeah, but does, does Follett's Wi Fi allow peer to peer? Yes, we'll find out. Yeah, that's it. We're going to find out. <laughs> so if you connect to there on port 80 at this URL, you're gonna, and you're going to want to, you just want to go to this. I got it. And the, the file is empty. Yeah, someone is downloading now. The question though is. You got a directory list. Yeah. You want the playlist.m3u8. Load that up in a Chrome browser on mobile. Oh, yeah. Someone got a segment file. It is. Is the bunny playing on your yeah, mobile? It is playing. Oh, it just rotated. You have audio. It's the. I don't get to it. So that's what I'm saying. This is one of the benefits with that. See the bunny? With those command line tools, you could rapidly po prototype something as, from the command line, like a streaming video server. And you can see where you could go from there. And like I said, any from that command line, could, you could code a C application to do that if you wanted. So at least one person saw the bunny. So. 
dollars a movie. And, and all of that, again, another reason I'm transplanting it down to 720 in this case is to reduce the network congestion. Like, probably we're at a low usage time of day at the company, but if everyone starts hitting that and, and streaming video over Wi Fi, very. You can't have too many active video streams over Wi Fi before you run out of bandwidth. So, one of the ways to get around that is to reduce the amount of data you're transferring by scaling the video. That's it. Nice. I guess you guys asked questions as we went along. Yeah. So, that uh, NVIDIA microboard, you're actually running a software decoder on there, or what were, you, what were you, did you get one of those, or what were you using it for, exactly? So, I did, <clears throat> I did have one that the company bought to do some benchmarks, yeah. and what we've, well, here's, the, here's the thing about the NVIDIA board. If you're just going to transcode the video, <clears throat> like let's say you're going to transcode 4K 265 video and re-encode as 720 X264 video. You can do that with very little CPU utilization and you actually have those core, this, the CUDA cores aren't even used during that transcode process. The GPU has those hardware codecs to decode and encode the video. Those are separate hardware on your GPU. The CUDA cores are just sitting there idle. So you could construct a pipeline and, <clears throat> and people are doing this now where you decode the video, and then you write a plug-in that does some CUDA processing. I saw one that was doing a grayscale. They, they demonstrated using the CUDA cores in GStreamer to run a grayscale algorithm at 4K at 60 frames a second. They're like just something they did for a demo. But you can imagine really anything that you could do on those CUDA cores, any video processing algorithm you could do. And you could do it at 4K resolution at 60 frames a second because you have all that wow. hardware. It just, just transcoding the video turns out because that hardware exists, those ASICs exist. When you get a GPU, it just comes with your GPU already. You still have all this processing power available to you. So that, that, that's a board that's got its own operating system? Just sits Runs Linux. Runs Ubuntu Linux. Ubuntu, yeah, and it just sits on your network and you talk to it. Yeah, or, and you could have like a, you could plug a 4K monitor into it also, or I don't, I don't know if we, you could plug a monitor into it. I don't know if it did 4K. I don't remember. Okay. Probably, cool. I I plugged a 1080p monitor in it. I don't know if you could plug 4K. Probably. Um, another thing that they were doing like with with that uh, Nvidia Tiger board, there was a demo I saw where they were using like motion tracking. So like the cat would enter the field of the the webcam comes up that the development board also comes with a webcam. So let's say a, a, your house cat enters the field of view, it starts tracking it and you could have it do something like fire a laser pointer and try to entertain <laughs> your cat. And it would just be sitting there processing a, your video screen until he's it's already got, he's already got yeah. on his list. Until it, <laughs> until it uses its advanced deep learning AI to recognize a cat has entered the video screen and then could just yeah. amuse it with a laser pointer. <laughs> That's like an actual demo with a tiger board. <laughs> but yeah, whatever video processing algorithm you want.